right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Los Angeles by Frumi Rachel Barr. How are you doing, Frumi? I'm doing fine. Maybe I should put my glasses on too so we both look smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. I know they they don't really work for me. They don't make me look any smarter. But anyway, <laughs> and as um, and Fumi is the founder of Bar Business School. Uh, is an expert in scaling businesses. She leads CEOs through growth with a focus on communication, alignment, and accountability. And has spent over twenty years blending practical leadership with academic knowledge. She's also the celebrated author of a CEO's secret weapon a top ranked business book that actually forwarded by Simon Sinek. And we're going to talk about today is how to retain and engage employees. Okay. Oh, that sounds like a good thing to talk about, doesn't it? Yeah. So, um, so uh, if, Rumi, let's get, let's get into this, right? Uh, retaining um, and motivating and attracting employees. It's a very different. It, it, it's a very different thing nowadays, given that the nature of work has changed. So, we have some people who still work in offices, some people who work hybrid, sometimes in offices, sometimes not. Some people are totally virtual. Some people are globally dispersed. So now you have people in lots of different situations, culturally from all over the place. And yet, at the same time, the organization has to figure out how to get all of these people motivated and working well together. So how do you do that? Well, you know, I had the pleasure of working with a remote team. And there were eight of us. And the way we did that, we were really very intentional. We started every single meeting with a review of our values. So there were eight of us. We happened to have eight values, so it worked kind of nicely. And what we did was everybody shared a value and what it meant and whether or not that was the value that they lived up to that week. Mm -hmm. And if you were late to a meeting, guess what? You had to share all eight of the values. Mm -hmm. So, of course, everybody had them on their desktop, et cetera. But, you know, that really brings them to life because yeah. it's one thing to know what your company values are. Like with that particular company, I'm a co-founder of a pet technology company. And uh, the, the company's called Scholar. And for that company, our number one value was family first. Right. Human and furry. Right. And what that meant was if my dog, let's say, was having an episode or something, I would be able to say to the team, you got to go. Enzo needs me. And mm -hmm. everyone, no one would criticize me. And you know that in some companies, if you say you need to go to your grandmother's funeral, they give you like three hours off. And that. Yeah. That's not cool, right? <laughs> or they or they say, well, how close were you to your grandmother, really? <laughs> how many grandmothers do you have? Yeah, many, yeah, you've had you've another one. Come on. <laughs> um, but no, I, I I agree. And I think I think that's what uh, I think the, the word that you mentioned there is the intentional part because a lot of companies will say, Oh, yes, we have values, and they maybe have their values and they have their mission and their vision statements, they've all of these things, but um, but they're just bumper stickers at the end of the day. They don't really mean anything. Um, I think that's the whole, that's the key. There is the intentionality around it. And I think recognizing that we do live in a world where there's so many different generations and people are dispersed and that you have to be intentional because it's, if you just leave it to organic, it, it's going to be a mess. And, you know, we also want to, when we get into a meeting, it's like we want to dive right in. We mm. don't always want or think about the warm and fuzzies that maybe should come first, especially for some people. And so another thing to do that I like to start a meeting off with is give me a highlight, give me a rose, a bud, or a thorn. So a rose is that wonderful thing that happened, whether it's personal or business. Uh, a bud is something hopeful, mm -hmm. a, a new lead that you're excited about. And obviously a thorn is a challenge. And if, if everyone shares, either, not all three, but just a, a rose, a bud, or a thorn, you really get to know them. And that's what's key because you're not hanging around the water cooler anymore. Mm. So how do we create that collaboration, that collegi how would you say, collegiality? Yeah, or collegial. Collegiality? <laughs> <laughs> yes. How do you create that if you're not in person? So you have to work at it. Mm -hmm. And then you can get into the business of the meeting. 
And you know, meetings don't have to be an hour. They could be 25 minutes and very productive. But yeah. having some kind of framework, I think, really helps when you're trying yeah. to get that engagement. And I think that's the other thing. I think the, uh, as you said, I mean, meetings don't need to be an hour. They can be 15 minutes. They can be 20 minutes. I don't know why people, you know, seem to think that you can only have a 30 minute or an hour long meeting. That there's nothing, there's no other configuration possible. Uh, I, and I think, uh, you know, that's part of it as well. But like you said, I mean, it, it's it's that idea of being intentional, then being organized and making sure that you, that people don't feel like, well, I'm a little bit outside the loop because maybe I'm in a time zone that's awkward for everybody else. Right. You know, something I found fascinating recently, I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about how since the pandemic, it's almost like people have forgotten how to behave in the workplace. Mm. So we actually created um, a workplace etiquette course for the school. And it's things like you go out to dinner. Have you ever been out to dinner, John, when someone says, oh, you're paying. I think I'll have a steak. <laughs> Indeed. Well, do you think that's great business etiquette? Oh, um, absolutely not. Absolutely not. But they don't know that. How mm. do people know? It's, so business etiquette isn't just about or when you go out for dinner, for example. It's not about knowing which fork to use. Mm -hmm. It's really about the conversations to have, how you treat the waiter. Mm -hmm. So I had a little fun with this particular course because it's everything from how you behave with different cultures to how you behave in the office when it is hybrid. You started mm -hmm. off by talking about all these different situations. Well, not everybody is comfortable going back to the office. Yeah. And how do they behave? Do they hang over your cu cubicle when you're talking on the phone? Right. No, I, I think I think people I think you're right. I think people have there's a lot of behaviors that have changed and not for the better either uh, uh, over the last while since since the pandemic, uh, as we've discussed before as well. But no, I, I think that's I think that's a huge thing. I think people have 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 forgotten or perhaps never learned properly, you know, how to interact properly. And now, especially, as you say, interacting in different ways. I had a I had a fantastic uh head of sales who worked for me one time and she used to do exactly what you're talking about but you know bring in a new person for interviews and we do the role plays and the interviews and then she'd say oh it must have been a that's been a long morning for you like let's you know i'll, I'll take you for lunch yeah, let you and i go for lunch and what the interviewee didn't realize or the smart ones did was that she knew that some people would go, oh, cool, this is relaxed now. I'm outside of the process. I can like be my real self and stuff. And it's the lunch that knocked a lot of people out of that job. Right. And you know what? Another thing I remember one, one CEO was telling me how they had a woman who went through about five different interviews mm -hmm. and they hired her. At the first office party, she got drunk. And she behaved very inappropriately. And you can't ask those questions no. in an interview. So guess what? She she was made available to industry right after that party. Right, right, right. Exactly. But I mean, the point is, again, like you said, I mean, it's just it's that, uh, you know, we can't always uh, assume, you know, common sense or etiquette in these situations. And I think the other part, too, is. Uh, as you said, Nina, now if we're going to be communicating with each other and with employees and all of that kind of stuff, and we're going to be doing a lot of it virtually, I think that's another place where etiquette and manners really need to play an important part. Because if I'm if I'm on a call with you now and you keep seeing me do this. Like, <laughs> Don't you dare. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, you know what? I was in a board meeting the other day. And there were about 35 people in the meeting. Do you know that nobody turned their cameras on? And that made it very awkward for me because I mm. believe in having yeah. my camera on. How else does somebody know if you're really participating? And then, of course, uh, when the CEO called on different people, they weren't all you know, pressing the button to unmute themselves quickly. He couldn't tell if they were there or not. Right, right, right. And yeah, just think, they flip that on its head for a second and just think about that uh, in, in a pre-virtual world, right? Can you imagine saying, hey, uh, 
through me. I'm going to come in. We're going to meet, but you're going to meet in that. You're going to go and sit in that meeting room over there. And I'm going to sit in this one. I'm going to call you from there. I'm not actually, cause I don't want you to see me. And you know, I want to be playing on my phone and all of that. I mean, the stuff that you would never do in front. Of, well, some people do now, unfortunately, <laughs> but generally back in the day, you know, you wouldn't have done these things, but why is it okay for you to do them now? It isn't. It's just, I think it's a question of really understanding what etiquette is all about and, and how you either edify your brand or diminish it. Mm -hmm. So to me, if you're, well, the one thing I will tell you is I have two monitors. So when I am looking at this monitor because somebody's sharing a slide, sure, I actually say I have two monitors. So if I'm looking there, it's because I'm looking at your slides. And I think it's important to say that because I don't want somebody to think I'm not paying attention. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the other thing somebody mentioned the other day is to say, you know, uh, if you see me looking down like this, it's literally because I'm taking some notes here. I want to take some notes on what you're saying rather than you just doing that and assuming they understand it. And then they think, oh, right. So you've got your phone down there. You're watching the football. I don't know what you're doing. Exactly. So how do you think other companies are making sure they retain and uh, engage their employees? I think a lot of what you just went back to, what you said about, I think it, it, the intentionality piece is is huge. I think it's, and the communication piece and figuring out how to communicate effectively with people who like to consume information differently. But I think it all comes back to, to honestly for me, is to, to, is to actually identifying and addressing the issue and saying, okay, we need to be deliberate about how do we retain people? How do we motivate people? And, and frankly, you know, how do we um, help people find new careers if they're not uh, performing? So, you know, one of the things I want to share with you is the reason we started the business school was because so many entrepreneurs and leaders don't learn all the practical stuff when they go in, when they're in school. Yep. So you learn how to be an entrepreneur, but that doesn't mean you necessarily know about strategy or execution or cash management or, or any of those things. So I guess my focus is really to engage with companies and let them know that one way to keep your people is to educate them, give them opportunities for education, because everybody wants to leave a job better than when they arrive. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to do that for them? And in the old days, you would send them through an MBA program, but now they're too expensive. So now what they do is they give people or reimburse them for taking a course. But if they leave, they have to pay the money back. Right, right, right. So it kind of defeats things. Yeah, that's so that's kind of handcuffs. <laughs> yes, it's handcuffs. Yeah. So that's why we started the school and we actually started it during the pandemic because okay. people were... Well, because people started to realize that they could get education online, yeah. well, not just in the original online schools, but yeah. And And I think the other part uh, for me is the whole idea of coaching and mentoring, right? I mean, I think that if you can put a coaching or mentoring program in place in your organization, and it doesn't, I mean, that sounds very grand. It doesn't have to be like that, but, it, but just that you have your your maybe your more tenured your more experienced your more expert people you know men, mentor buddy up and mentor somebody and even that small investment and it only has to be a, a relatively small investment of time but it just has to be consistent can make a massive difference because as you said is like who doesn't want to learn right right i think mentoring programs are really critical you know obviously not every company can afford to get people coaches but mentoring doesn't have to be that way. Mentoring is just matching people within an organization with people who need to learn something. It's a very, um, it's almost a transaction. Yeah. I need to learn how maybe how to close when you're selling. You're a really good closer. Will you teach me how to close? What does that look like? How often do we meet? Do we meet every week for a month? Do you listen in on some of my conversations? Mm -hmm. That's that's mentoring. And yeah. that's, that would, would engage people and yeah. retain them because they will leave better. Yeah. And, 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 and a mentoring program for that. 
Yeah, and the key, I think the key there is, no, absolutely, you don't need a former program, but I mean, the key to that then is the consistency because there's nothing that, it can be very counterproductive if I say, for me, I'm going to do all this for you and I'm going to mend and I'm going to help you. And then I put it, let's put it, let's put it on our calendar, this weekly session. And then, you know, we do the first week and the second week. Oh, sorry, something came up. Let's, we'll just catch up next week, right? And then next week, oh, can we move it to Friday? And before you know it, you're far from mentoring you. I'm actually just sending the message that, I don't really care about this. This isn't important to me and therefore you're not important to me. Yes, and you know what? That's key because people really have to know that they matter. Mm -hmm. I think in a way more than getting bonuses or more than boosting your salary, people want to feel that they're contributing and they want to feel that they matter and that their managers care because they always say that people leave managers. They don't leave companies. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah. And what you were saying earlier, actually, it's interesting. I was talking to somebody the last week who does who does a lot of work with uh, companies who hire um, hourly, hourly people. Right. You know, so, you know, franchises, restaurants, all of that kind of thing. And you would think, uh, OK, that's a hard. How do you motivate somebody who's maybe just taken that job because they need to make some cash or whatever turnovers high on that? One of the things was was. Uh, some of the people who ran like franchises and stuff, they would say to some of their employees, do you want to learn about the business? I'll yeah. teach you. I will teach you about the business. And suddenly you have these early people who are now highly motivated because that's not what they want to do for the rest of their lives. But they want to learn, you know, they want to go on and do things. But they're now learning business skills from the franchise owner. So I think it doesn't matter what kind of company you're in. I think when you have employees, it's really important to understand what motivates them, yeah. to ask them. You know, often when people aren't performing, what I ask is, is it a question of motivation or ability? Mm. Because sometimes people don't have the ability and it's OK if they just say, I don't know how to do that. I'd like to learn or it's motivation. So which is it? And that yeah. you need to ask, you need to have those conversations. Yeah. And I think the other thing about, uh, you know, that certainly came out of COVID and that is starting to maybe be a little bit more understanding and flexible around people's circumstances, because sometimes it's as simple as if somebody works remotely and they can drop their kids off at school at whatever time of the morning and they can pick them up in the afternoon and they still do the work and they still put in the hours and they for you to be like okay and flexible that that is very motivating if you say you know let's talk about what what uh, um what work configuration works best for you and i'll see whether it works for us and we'll come to some kind of compromise but that's a lot better than people having to say oh it's okay i'm just going to pop out to grab my kids you know kind of fearing what the reaction would be it's much better that you say okay what's the optimum configuration for your job right now both for you and for us so that always comes back to setting expectations right from mm -hmm. the beginning. I remember years ago before Zoom, before any, any of these uh, video conferencing tools, just having a, a conference call. I remember there was a marketing team I was working with that was very dispersed. And the lead marketing person said, how do I know if people are working? How do I know if they're working from nine to five? And my answer was, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you set the expectation. They know exactly what they need to pre perform to, what success looks like for them. And if they work six hours or 10 hours, what's the difference? Yeah. No. The job in six, good for them. Yeah. And, and the other part of that, too, for me is, uh, you know, they could be sitting in the office for eight hours a day and doing nothing. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, they could be daydreaming. They could be doing other stuff. They not necessarily... Uh, just because they're physically present doesn't mean they're actually present. That's right. So how do we keep them present? We keep them, we share the values, as we said. Mm -hmm. We find out what motivates them. We give them more education. I think it's easy. You yeah. just have to do it, right? Uh, and, you, and your point is a really good one, too, around like if they're delivering and they're meeting and they're doing exactly what they, you know, what you want them to do and they're meeting, you know, your expectations for the work, if they're if they're if they're getting it done and faster and quicker and they can leave early or whatever instead I mean we've kind of grown up in this thing where we would go oh I need to give them more work right instead of like recognizing that wow you know good for them that they're able to yeah 
they're able to fulfill the role and some without needing to spend all the hours. And of course, there's so much more talk about uh, wellness in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So it's important not to create a an environment where everybody has to be a work workaholic. Yeah, and that I think is the if there's one thing I I think culturally uh, because it's spread across the world now. It's not just the U.S., but it was certainly when I first came to the U.S. 25 or 26 years ago. Um, you know, let's face it, uh, the biggest badge of honor you can have is being stressed, overworked, uh, working all the hours, working late, doing all of that. It was like, that's what, you know, that was a badge of honor because that showed how much you cared. And that's what people, and that's what people, I mean, you even see in job descriptions, that's what people are looking for. You know, I want somebody who's going to go above and beyond, blah, 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 blah. And, and we have to, we have to get away from that because that that doesn't help our health it doesn't really help our work product at the end of the day and it doesn't and it and it it drives people away exactly so listen uh, Fumi, as usual this has been a great great conversation um all of Fumi's information is going to be below this video but before we go please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do ah so I have what I call a portfolio career, which is a little different, it means I do several things. Sometimes I step in as an interim CEO if the CEO wants to go to Tuscany for a month and leave a face in, in charge, play all day and talk to me in the evening. Or sometimes somebody's ill and they, want, they need someone to step in or generational transfers. You have a kid and you're not quite sure if they can handle it yet. So you bring in someone for the sidecar. That would be me. And when I'm not doing that, I have my school. And th this is my passion project. And one of the things I love is we offer free courses to veterans and their spouses. Mm. This is in honor of my dad. And um, that's what I do. I, I love what I do. It's my passion project. Excellent. When I go, as I said, go check it out. It'll all be below this video. And, uh, you know, if you're a military or a military family, there you go. You get free education. I mean, uh, and, and Froomey does fantastic work. So... I would encourage you to go check it out. Well, listen, thanks again for your insights. Thank you for watching and listening, and I will see you all again very soon. Thank you.